Hey everyone, Jordan and Rochelle here. I'm an evolutionary astrologer along with an herbalist, yoga teacher, and a couple other healing modalities under my belt. And so today I just wanted to talk with you guys a little bit about how I blend these things and how it's really helpful when you are working on developing and writing a new healing story for yourself. We all, you know, we are all working on a lot of self-healing right now with Chiron and Aries. And so this has really been probably one of the top conversations that I'm finding myself repeating with clients. And so I figured let's make a video about this for people to be able to work on it for themselves and to kind of have a little bit of direction on how to find this kind of healing story information in your own chart. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of my methods, sort of my light version of the methods and a little bit about um, some different mythology and also then going into um, a little bit of medical astrology, but tied in with um, just overall constitutional awareness, right? And so maybe if you're familiar with Ayurveda, this might sound familiar to you, or um, if you are a healer, work with herbs, these kinds of things. So this is really, um, this talk is an hour long, and we're not going to be able to go into everything, but my hopes are to be able to just offer a little bit of a different perspective on things. If, you know, maybe you're coming at this from only the astrology side, or maybe you're coming at this from more the healing side. And so, you know, the, the goal is to really see how everything is interconnected. The stories that we tell ourselves, our healing journey, our physiology, our psychology, all of these things are inextricably linked. And so the more we're able to use our chart to really dive into our healing intentionally with conscious intention, the easier we can be on a smooth path toward a conscious evolution. So welcome and thank you for tuning in. So Let's share this and dive in. <clears throat> so, like I said, welcome to Write a New Healing Story and Intro to Astro Therapeutics with me. If you have more questions later, you can always contact me on my website or find me on Instagram. And so, whenever I'm working with clients or even with myself, um, as self-healing really is a constant journey. And even if you're working as a healer with other people, you're still always coming back to the self, right? And so this is a constant thing that I'm doing. I'm always asking, what's your Chiron story? What's your Aries story? What's your moon story? What's your Aquarius story? What's your Mercury story, especially during Mercury retrograde, right? Like what's your anything fill in the blank story? And this just gives you um, a nice way to dive into your own awareness around that archetype. Because the more awareness we have of, of kind of where maybe our shortcomings are or our limitations and our understanding of that archetype are, the easier we know, you know, where to fill in. Maybe have you thought of this? This is something we can do with ourselves. And this is definitely something that it helps to work with others, you know, to kind of bounce ideas off of just talking about it. Um, I don't know about you, but I always find for myself that I have repeating stories in my mind, right? I think that's kind of part of the human condition, yeah? And sometimes I'm pretty convinced that they're true until I go and say something to somebody. And then I hear myself say it out loud. I kind of say what that train of thought was going for a long time, maybe a couple months. I say it out loud and I'm like, whoa there's a giant hole in that logic or what I said is fundamentally not true. It's a lie. I've been lying to myself. Oh my goodness. I need to shift this, this way of thinking it happens all the time, right? We get kind of caught in these stories. We get caught in these patterns, especially if we keep them inside. Um, I've taught a lot of English classes and, and in teaching about writing, I always tell my students, read your writing out loud because our minds, our eyes, especially when we're only relying on our on one sense, right? Our our sense of sight, we can skim over things. Our our brains kind of fill in the pattern, right? So that it makes sense to us in terms of understanding it. But then we can miss a lot of grammatical errors. We can miss, oh, that's a really long run on sentence. You know, we can miss, wow, that does just doesn't sound right. Something's off there. And so I always say, read it out loud, because then at least you're using two senses and then maybe even walk around a little bit while you're reading. Oh, okay, now I'm using my kinesthetics, right? Like try to get at all of your stories from as many different angles as possible, because then you can witness the flaws. You can witness the lies a little bit easier. You can pick out what's wrong. 
Think about it, you know, you're putting every single word that we speak, we're casting spells with our stories. And so we want to make sure that we're casting spells of a story that we would like to read, especially when it comes to health. Um, one of the number one issues that I see and have also experienced within myself is that we can get very attached to story around health. For example, if my grandmother has diabetes and I, you know, I know that it runs in the family, I, I can have this fear, this worry that I could get diabetes. And so then I have a choice. It's like, oh, maybe I'm starting to see some indicators. Oh, well, I can just give in and say, oh, well, you know, my grandma had diabetes, my mom had diabetes, I'm just going to have to have diabetes too. That's just my karma. It's just what I'm working with. While that may be true, you know, it is, it is true that we do carry this ancestral healing line. It, it doesn't have to continue that way. And we do have power over our world words and our thoughts and therefore our attitude towards things. And then that can just open up a whole line of, of different thinking around what's going on. So while it might be true that you have the, you know, in your family diabetes, it's not necessarily true that you have to get it or the same kind of thing with arthritis or, um, depression, anxiety, right? That's something that definitely I've, I've worked with a lot, you know, anxiety runs in my family and I'm like, oh, okay. I could either say, okay, I'm going to have to just succumb to this and realize, oh, I'm going to have anxiety forever. Or I can realize, whoa, this is something that I'm healing and clearing for myself as an individual, but I'm also healing and clearing it for my entire family line and for future generations and for the world, right? If you look at most people's pain points around their stories, they're very linked to just about the same primary core wounds, right? Um, wounds around rejection, abandonment, betrayal, loss, and all of these fears kind of feed into our stories around our jobs, our security, our family, our relationships. Um, our children, you know, our creativity, our purpose, how we show up in service in the world. And so when we have a wound, maybe underneath one of those stories, like I have a, a fundamental wound that of abandonment or rejection that could fuel in your career something linked to not enoughness and, and workaholism and, and feeling like you can never do enough or get enough right? So there could be a fundamental core wound of just not enoughness. And then you can see how that just spreads to everything in your life, right? And so this is why we want to get to the root of these stories so that we can change that, so that we can consciously work with it, so that we can use our power to move beyond those limiting stories. And, you know, as astrologers, we know the, the benefits and, and the importance and use of story in astrology, right? Like the majority of the way that we understand archetypes like Mercury through Hermes and, and Thoth and, you know, the Chiron story, the wounded healer and his whole journey into finding um, wisdom and, and Ceres, you know, a Ceres and Persephone, you know, the Mars Venus stories, the Sun stories, Apollo, like we are aware of the power and importance of mythology um, and I think that the more we become aware of how we can sort of tie these things together within ourselves, the greater chances of our healing. So that's my goal today, to dive in a little bit more into that. Um, you know, and so if you're working with somebody and they're not necessarily an astrologer or have a lot of information about these, these stories. They don't have to know them in order to find great healing from them. And you don't have to necessarily know the whole story in order to um, provide some, some healing. You know, a basic background and kind of like these are the themes that these, you know, say somebody doesn't know the whole story of Ceres and Persephone, but, you, you know, you mentioned themes around um, loss, motherhood, seasons, cycles. Um, maybe feelings of abandonment or rejection or letting go or surrender or food or harvest. You know, you can just kind of put out those kinds of those words and then, you know, ask somebody, what's your food story? How do you relate with food? Um, you know, because series being so linked with things like eating disorders um, and just kind of being um, off with the cycles, the feminine cycles, maybe. So ask people like, what, what is your story around femininity? What's your motherhood story? you know, without necessarily needing to, to explain what the whole story is, but then starting to see, okay, they're, they're experiencing this part of that myth right now. And maybe 
you can know as the astrologer on the other side, oh, have you thought about another version of this story? Have you thought about another ending? Have you thought about just another way to see this story? And then kind of the wisdom and the morals and the lessons that come out of that story, usually to try to reclaim power or balance or some type of resolution. So hopefully that makes sense. So like I mentioned, it's Chiron and Aries time for at least the next eight years, if I'm doing my math correctly, 2027. 20, but this is a big focus on self-healing. And like I mentioned, we can be our own best therapist, you know, and I say that with, with a grain of salt, you know, as I've worked with a lot of people doing therapy and counseling, and sometimes you can get to a place where you can't untie your own knots. And so it's amazing and, and so needed to get the help when you need it. But when you are in a space of, you know, you, you have the motivation and the drive and you want to work on your own self-healing, it is possible for you to do this work for yourself. And I really feel like that knowledge, that empowerment, that you, you do have the capability to work on your own self-healing, that really that's what you came here to do as a soul. Your higher self knows what you need at all times. That trust, the trust in your impulses, trusting your instincts for what is right for you, you know, that divine um, link, that link to the divine straight from source, Aries, healing, <laughs> right? So you do have the power to do that. And a lot of it comes down to identifying and understanding our patterns and then linking them to our pain points. What is it? Get really clear on what are the pain points. And then to even take it further, because sometimes we're not entirely sure, right? We're, we might have anxiety, but have no idea why. You know, we're looking around in our life and we're like, there's not really anything going on. <laughs> I'm pretty happy. Um, maybe look at your body. Look at what you're eating. Look at how your physiology interconnects with your psychology because that's also very crucial, right? Like um, when we're thinking about the holistic person, the holistic being, we've got, you know, the, the four quadrants, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental. Most often mental and emotional have a really strong correlation and then physical and spiritual have a really strong correlation. So it's like if you're feeling kind of low or off balance in your emotions, you can often use some sort of mental um, efforts to kind of balance out the emotions, right? Like you can use things like affirmations, you can make a new choice of what to do in, around your emotions, right? And same thing with physical and spiritual. If you're feeling um, maybe not very uh physically well right like you know it would be a good idea if you went for a walk but maybe you're not feeling very good um maybe you do something kind of what we would call in the spiritual um quadrant maybe like meditating or grounding energy healing just deep breathing those kinds of things and so they can often feed one another and so then when one is out of balance typically the other one is out of balance too right so if we're a little bit off balance in our spirituality we're not very connected with our purpose Typically, something funky goes on in the physical body, you know, whether that's stress, whether that's, you know, just you're being, um, you're in a hurry because you're working maybe a job that you haven't quite figured out how to navigate the ins and outs of your schedule. So you're always hurrying and not eating the best for your body. And, and on top of that, you're, you're miserable because you don't feel fulfilled on a soul level. This is a big North Node Cancer theme this year, right? Um, you know, you want to take a look at, kind of how, how are you being spiritually filled by what you're physically doing, right? So there's, there's a really big picture here. And you want to see kind of where are you fitting in that? Where are you kind of low? Where are you high? What, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? This is where we get into the chart stuff, right? You can really look at the chart and be like, okay, I'm really strong in this area. Um, and I'm kind of deficient in this area. And I can use my strengths to sort of fill in for my deficiencies quote-unquote deficiencies, right? Um, I really believe that there's nothing bad in the chart. We, we all choose it for our, you know, purposes of evolution. Higher self knows exactly what we need. So again, coming down to trust. Everything's interconnected. Those are probably the premises of, of, of basically my beliefs in working with people. Okay, so there are a lot of pain points, right? When you're getting into this work, start with one. <laughs> Just start with the one that's at the top of your mind. Don't overwhelm yourself. You know, say 
you know, you've got a million things going on, your relationships going kind of crazy, work is kind of like, oh, I'm not sure about this, and my hip is hurting, and um, I'm just, I'm busy all the time, I can't find my feet. What's on the top of your mind, right? Maybe we choose one thing and we focus on something like anxiety, right? Okay, now, now we've got, okay, this is our, this is our pain point, or at least this is the surface of our pain point. We might find something deeper later, but for now, we're going to start with this. Okay, I want to work on my anxiety. Now, what in the chart may have something to do with anxiety? Well, we know that Mercury, ruling the mind, also has an affinity for the nervous system, might be something going on with Mercury. We definitely know that Uranus can have a lot to do with anxiety, kind of ruling that electromagnetic field in the body and also being sort of the individuated unconscious, meaning there's a lot of information that Uranus is just like, here, you want some of this? <laughs> you want some of this that you thought you buried deep down in your subconscious? No, you're gonna get it right now. And you're gonna be like, whoa, what's going on? Where did that insight come from? I'm not ready for this. I don't want this insight, right? That can cause anxiety. Look at the planet, the phasal relationship between Mercury and uh, Uranus, right? Okay, so that's just an example. And then from there, you can maybe extrapolate. So. What's, what is there a really strong aspect between maybe Mercury and Uranus and then maybe Mars? Maybe Mars is currently transiting and triggering that. Maybe the moon just happens to be there that day. And so it's bringing up a lot of emotional stuff that you maybe, um, you know, is triggering anxiety kinds of things. Maybe Venus is there, a person in your life has just come by and reminded you of everything you are trying to forget, right? So we want to look not only at the natal chart, but also at the transits, of course. Okay, so once we've identified the associated planets and archetypes therein, we go deep into that. We begin and we continue, okay? Because a lot of times when it comes to things like healing, often brings up necessary forgiveness that needs to happen or compassion or love or some sort of, um, you know, soothing, bringing ease to a situation or bringing some sort of surrender sometimes. A lot of times we get caught up in the, in the idea that it's a one-time decision, right? Like say somebody, say there's a wound around rejection or abandonment and, you know, it has to do with your father and your father's still alive and you guys still sort of have a relationship, um, but you, you thought you forgave him, but then, you know, stuff happens and there's more layers to the onion than you originally thought were there so you begin that process of forgiveness and then you continue it and you continue to choose forgiveness you continue to choose the next loving thought the next loving word right and so it's not a one-time decision that's what i think trips a lot of people up it's not a one-time decision when it comes to healing it's a it's a continuous road of decisions that um, eventually become a lot easier once you do them more and more and more. And, and I think it's also adopting the framework of mind, the philosophy that what you are healing and clearing for yourself, you're also healing and clearing for the world, right? Like we know that um, there's, you know, universal archetypes, right? And as a collective, we can all identify with those archetypes at some point in our life, right? That's why all of us, we all have all signs in the chart. We all connect with every archetype at some point in our life, whether through ourselves or another person or some experience. So since we all have the same root, we all have the same collective link to universal archetypes. What we are healing for ourselves is also something that we are healing and clearing for the world. Because most of us are learning more about forgiveness. Most of us are learning about compassion. All of us have a healing journey. It's not always something physical and it's not always something really obvious, but all of us have something to contribute, right? All of us have Chiron in our chart. And okay, and I'll stop there and I'll go into the next slide. I can get kind of excited and say all my information before I change slides. Okay, so common pain points and where to look in the chart. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is something that I highly suggest that you do um, for yourself as an astrologer, right? Like you know when somebody's coming to you and you, they're talking about their pain points, they're talking about where they need healing, and say they're they're just they're not happy with their career or their job or their contribution to the world. There are some these are some basics that you might want to look at, and there's definitely more, and there's definitely aspects and, and combinations of things, but just to kind of get you an idea and get you started. 
Um, so you want to look at the sun, kind of like, are they feeling like they're living their purpose? Are they, what's going on with the midheaven I see, fourth house, tenth house? What's going on also with Cancer Capricorn, right? Especially right now um, with the North Node in Cancer, South Node Capricorn, with Saturn and Pluto, there's a lot of stuff that we're moving beyond and healing from when it comes to structure and society and feeding our soul. And how does that all come together in terms of our career and our job and how we are showing up in service, especially with Neptune 12th house Pisces. How are we showing up in service? How are we linked to the whole? And very similar to like social expectations, beliefs, if someone's having, you know, that kind of feeling of not enoughness, like I'm an astrologer, but I should be a doctor or something, you know, there, there's always, always these ideas of something more or bigger or better that you're supposed to be based on social expectations or beliefs around that. So if somebody's kind of struggling with that, definitely look at Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Pallas, Athene, because remember, Pallas, Athene has a link to um, kind of like maybe how you're supposed to show up as a woman in society, right? Um, Juno, maybe are there social expectations around your marriage? Um, again, Neptune, 12th house, Sagittarius, 9th house, our beliefs. Remember, um, what we believe we're supposed to be doing in the world often shows up in the 10th house of kind of what we do end up doing in the world, right? So all of these, these archetypes feed off of one another. Definitely look at Mercury. Look at Mercury for thought patterns. Um, what kind of things do we continuously repeat to ourselves that um, cause us pain, right? So again, sex and relationships. You can look at the obvious. Venus, Libra, Pluto, Scorpio, 7th and 8th houses, Moon, um, Vesta, uh, Juno for commitments and commitment issues. Mars, you want to look at Mars, Venus, planetary pair. You also want to look at maybe Mars, Juno, and Venus, Juno, right? Because Juno has a lot to do with commitments and relationships and soul contracts. So is there a pain point around that? Um, and a lot of times you're going to see the pain points represented through the squares and oppositions, the inconjuncts, the sesquiquadra. It's kind of like the, the hard aspects, right? But you can also see them with, with trines. And, and sex styles and, and conjunctions, definitely. It's, it's kind of like, how is the person identifying with that energy? Is it something that's easy for them? Is there a wound? Is there a shadow in there that needs to be worked through? You can find it anywhere, right? Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list of what you can find in the chart, but you know, a lot of times when we think of healing, it, it can be easy to oversimplify and think it's just Chiron, like, or maybe just Pluto, right? These tend to be, and maybe Saturn, we kind of look at these places and think, okay, this is where the wounds are, this is where the shadow is, this is where the hurt is, this is where the challenge is. Maybe, and yes, but also, you know, it's not a this or that, it's a this and that. It's a how does this relate with that? It's, you know, every single archetype, has a shadow side and an illuminated side. And every archetype also has a range and a spectrum. And so we wanna look at like kind of how is, how is the person, how are we relating with that archetype? What's our story like with that archetype? What's our Venus story, right? We tend to have these ideas, for example, like that Venus is always you know, the great, one of the great benefics along with Jupiter and that wherever Venus is, life's gonna be easy and just bunnies and rainbows and kittens, right? And sometimes that happens, but sometimes maybe Venus can show us what we want and don't have, right? That is very difficult. That brings up a lot of shadow. Maybe Venus can point out what you are wanting, but for some reason you're not manifesting, you're not attracting. Or the opposite, why am I attracting what I really don't want? Why do I keep attracting the same kinds of relationships? Why do I keep attracting illness? So remember, Venus has to do with what we are attracting, our point of attraction. So the law of attraction, right? It can work both ways. It can work all ways, right? Depending on... Um, Kind of what, what is the quality of our thoughts? What's the quality of our energy, our emotions, that kind of thing, our reactions, and so on. So you want to look at kind of what's going on for them in the chart and then extrapolate from there. And a lot of this, I love this picture because it kind of represents my, <laughs> my vision of what shadow work is. You know, you look at this and you're kind of, whoa, what is that? You know, it's kind of confusing. It's, it's, there's a lot of dark space in this picture. But then when you look, obviously, right in the center, there's that sunlight. There's that point of illumination, that point of consciousness, right? 
bringing that point of consciousness into what can be kind of like the murky shadow stuff. When we, when we are intentionally working with shadow, AKA pain of our past, pain in our body, pain in our mind, we have access to more of our light when we are willing to integrate the shadow. So something to consider. And so after you've identified the pain point, you know more or less what archetypes you're looking for in the chart. You wanna look at the myth and story surrounding the pain point, right? So some examples around you know, themes of rejection, you know, core wounds of rejection, abandonment, loss. Obviously look at Chiron, right? Who has one of the most known stories of rejection, you know, that fundamental wound of rejection, not being wanted by his parents, and then, you know, meeting up with Apollo, and then, oh, lo and behold, there's some blessings in there. Um, he ends up learning about medicine and healing and teaching and astrology from Apollo and ends up becoming one of the greatest healers and teachers in, in mythology, right? So we can look at that whole story of how it started as some sort of rejection, abandonment, loss, but eventually, um, ended up with some sort of reclamation of power, or reclamation of gifts, or some sort of um, resolution or happy ending, right? Um, that's one way to look at it. Definitely look at Sedna if you haven't already in your chart because Sedna tells pretty intense story of rejection. You know, first she's rejected by her father, she's basically sold off into marriage and does not want to be with the one she's married to and then he, the marriage partner ends up rejecting her and then she's cast out onto the streets as a homeless woman and society rejects her and then she ends up coming back with her father and instead of him there's a storm they're on a boat sorry i really skipped a lot of the story there but long story short he ends up cutting her fingers off and tossing her into the sea right talk about rejection talk about father issues right and then the, the end of the story, or at least one ending of the story, is that she becomes the goddess of the sea, and sailors revere her and know that they must um, honor her so that she supports them in their voyage at sea, right? So it's definitely a story about reclaiming power, especially as a woman, right? You can look at Ceres Persephone when it comes to, and, you know, look at also the asteroids, too. Basically, all... Um, almost all of the Greek myths and Roman myths that we are associating with astrology and also from other cultures as well, like the Mayan culture, um, you can find them as asteroids, right? So look, find, you know, on astro.com, where's this asteroid? What is the story with this asteroid, right? Where's, where's Lucifer? <laughs> where's, you know, where's Eurydice and Orpheus, right? Where are they? What's the story there? And then you end up finding a whole bunch of stuff that you never expected to find. Another thing I want to mention too, when you're looking at these myths and stories, is to remember that um, a lot of these stories are meant for us to understand that we are everybody in the story. We could, you know, different aspects of our consciousness, different aspects of our psyche can take on these different positions at different times in our life. And so, you know, a big part of it is to kind of identify, well, who am I in this story today? Who am I in this story right now? And who could I be? Who do I want to be? Who do I choose to identify with? And then maybe look at who you're choosing not to identify with, right? Sometimes we, most of the time, we don't want to identify with the ugly or the bad guy, right? But when we take ownership for maybe that part of us in our own psyche, instead of burying it deeper into the shadow, we take a look at it intentionally, consciously, lovingly with forgiveness. And we choose to love it which doesn't mean, you know, exonerate it from its, you know, the things that it's done. It just means um, integrate it, means find, find a better use for it than, you know, the part of you that's going to hold your spirit down in chains, right? Other examples like distrust or betrayal, definitely look at Juno, right? The stories of Hera and Zeus, um, look at Scorpio, Neptune, Pluto, anything with anger, rage, look at Mars, look at the asteroid Aries. It's really interesting also to know and read the stories between Mars and Aries, you know, Greek and, or yeah, well, Aries is the Greek and Mars is the Roman, but how, how they're very different in Roman and Greek mythology. Greek mythology basically paints Aries as just like this bloodthirsty fool who everybody hates. And then in Rome, Mars is held up in high esteem for you know, being the god of war and for basically making Rome what it was in power, passion, right? So 
even looking at the difference of how maybe as an individual, you look at your own anger, rage, AKA passion, right? AKA drive, life force, movement, masculine energy. What's your Aries story? What's your Mars story? This is huge for a lot of people, especially right now with Chiron and Aries, but also just as everybody collectively, we're all kind of working on healing and, and um, forgiving and bringing more greater compassion for the divine masculine as well as the divine feminine. But you know, whether you're a man or a woman, what, whatever you, whoever you identify with, whoever you are, we all have, you know, that animus, right? The anima, we have the opposites. And we, so we have masculine and feminine. And so if we are not healed in our masculine, it's very hard to be fully healed in your feminine and vice versa. So you wanna look at that. You wanna look at how are you, how, what's your relationship like with what you consider to be anger or rage masculinity, passion, drive, all of those things. Okay, and this is when we get into the really fun stuff. So hopefully this is not too much information if you're newer to medical astrology, um, but everything in the chart can be found in the body and everything in the body can be found in the chart, right? So, and, and this goes not only to like physical ailments, but also again to our, psycholo our psychology, our temperament, our emotions, our dispositions. Um, and so that's, that's what we want to be thinking about kind of always. Like just because say, for example, you've got an afflicted Mars, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have inflammation, heat, redness, and accidents might mean you have a really strong passion, but maybe on a shadow side, on a shadow day where that's kind of obvious, there's a lot of anger. And that could be, again, that could be showing up emotionally, or it could be showing up only physically, and you might not have yet conscious or psychological awareness as to why that's happening, or vice versa, right? Things can come from both ends. I think it's overly simplistic to say that every time you have some sort of physical issue, it's because you had a bad thought or your emotions are wonky or there's something wrong with your psychology. I think that's overly simplistic and I think it actually can do a lot of damage because people can be looking for something wrong with them that's maybe not there. Maybe you're eating the wrong things. <laughs> maybe it really is just physical, right? But sometimes it does also have an emotional component. So you want to just have that sort of awareness of the possibilities and not be too quick to judge and say this is what it is because it's usually a very complex story so anyways so when we're looking at anxiety we tend to see things so say we have the emotion of anxiety we tend to see also in the body muscular tension um wind right in the belly <laughs> any sort of knots in the stomach nervous system issues issues with gut health, maybe indigestion, and or just like changing body issues. Like you can't pinpoint what's going on in the body. The pain moves around. It's really, really typical with, with people who are prone to anxiety, people who are prone to depression or have um, experienced depression usually in the body. It manifests as coldness. And it might not be coldness in the whole body. It might be coldness just in a, a certain tissue, like coldness in the liver coldness in the gallbladder, right? It doesn't necessarily mean you have always cold hands and feet. Maybe your circulation is fine, but something's going on in the liver, right? So again, it's not, you know, don't want to oversimplify things. We want to be kind of clear on what we're looking at. But, you know, the depression is often associated with stagnancy in tissues, um, malnutrition, um, malabsorption of vitamins and minerals, and just overall energy inefficiency, like things are not being used efficiently in the body. Most of the time, it's like you, you could even be eating everything short of maybe vitamin K and magnesium and <laughs> nothing's being absorbed in your body and that can trigger depression, right? <clears throat> so... I have it listed as six tissue states, but really when we're talking about, you know, temperature, moisture, and tone, and, you know, is it hot, cold, wet, dry, is it tense, or is it relaxed? These are also just energetic states, right? So a person can have this sort of energetically, emotionally, psychologically, or it can also be manifested in the tissues. should also mention that remedies such as herbs have an affinity for these things. So herbs can either increase heat or decrease heat, bring cooling, right? Herbs can be wet or dry. They can make you tense or relaxed, right? And sometimes we want one or both of those things in a sort of combination so that we can kind of help people come back to their constitutional balance, which I'll talk about in a little bit. 
So when we're looking at temperature in this range of hot and cold, um, you want to look at what's going on maybe with Mars, with the sun, right? Um, with planets above the horizon, those kinds of things. Um, maybe what's going on with Leo and the fire signs, Aries, Sagittarius, kind of what's happening there. Also with Jupiter. Um, and, you know, so that those are the ones you're typically seeing for, you know, emphasize when there's a lot of heat. When there's a lot of cold, you're, you're tending to see things like Moon, Venus, Saturn, Pluto. Um, maybe Pluto can go kind of both ways. Pluto's funky. Neptune, right? And so those, that's kind of, those are the planets that are typically associated with cold, right? You want to look at what's the balance between those two. And then maybe even start thinking about it in yourself. Do you just overall tend to run hot or cold? Um, do you know, do you have often... Um, expressions in your body that indicate heat like rash fever um acne those kinds of things like um red dots on the tongue right um an inflamed tongue where you can kind of see the ridges that it that indicates inflammation in the body so that's a heat signature usually usually <laughs> and then, so then you can maybe go back to the chart, look at what's going on with the sun or Mars. So Mars, for example, can bring overheating very easily, can cause inflammation and anger. And maybe I shouldn't say cause, but correlate with influence. Um, or Mars can be underactive and not provide enough heat, right? This is very typical for water, water Mars signs, Earth signs, and maybe below the horizon. You know, if or if maybe Mars is kind of in a debilitated uh, sign or kind of just active, underactive and weak, and maybe there's like Moon and Saturn really, really active, which kind of brings it in the opposite direction. Um, you now, Mars can be subdued by the overly cooling planets like Moon, Venus, or Saturn in the body and in the temperament. With moisture, it can either be wet or dry, right? And so the moon, for example, governs the balance of fluids. So not getting enough fluids can lead to dryness, which can make it harder to filter emotions, right? Or to bring cooling or soothing when necessary. Say you're overheated and you're really angry and your passions are running hot um, and, you, and your moon is kind of not, maybe your moon is not in a strong sign that is kind of going to, expand the energy and that force of that sign right maybe it's like in aquarius or something like that or maybe it's also a fire sign like sagittarius it's going to be like adding to the heat right um it can just make it harder to to find grounding when you're having sort of like an anger explosion or something like that um and we know that evolution is biochemical right? And our emotions, that's how we evolve. We evolve through our emotions. And so when we're going through an incredibly difficult emotional time, it's, it's of the utmost importance to make sure that we're getting enough moisture, we're getting enough water, because that's what's going to keep us in balance in our emotions, in our temperament. So this is kind of how you can see, that's a very, very easy link to look at what's going on in the chart with the moon, maybe what's going on with the transiting moon, right? We, we have uh, conjunction, square, opposition, <laughs> trine with every single natal planet with the transiting moon every month. So we can look at these um, these patterns and see, okay, um, what what times of the month or maybe what phase of the moon is it in when I tend to get a little bit more dry or a little bit more wet, right? Looking at that in yourself. You know, you can look at your body, looking at the tongue. If you see like deep grooves in the tongue or, you know, there's kind of like looks like cracks in the tongue. That's usually um, pinpointing constitutional or just body dryness, dryness. You know, your tongue um, can, can show you the whole body, right? So is the tongue looking dry? Like it's got cracks all over the place and the tissues are probably dry, right? And so you wanna make sure to um, get a lot of water or maybe if you're having issues with retaining water, which the moon and also cancer, has a lot to do with your ability to retain water where you need it in the cells that require it. Maybe you need certain support, supportive herbs like marshmallow root or, or cinnamon who are both, you know, demulsants, moistening, who can kind of drive the moisture deeper into the tissues instead of expel them. Sometimes that happens too, right? You could drink enough water, but your body's not holding it in. So that becomes a whole other issue. And then finally, tone. 
um, tissues and energetic states. You're either in a state of tension or relaxation or somewhere in between on that scale. And then, you know, there's that combination, you know, is it hot, cold, wet, dry, intense, or relaxed? So say you have somebody who's hot, wet, and tense. What might that look like in their, in their temperament? Maybe somebody who's cold, dry, intense, it's going to look totally different than maybe somebody who's cold, wet, relaxed, right? So we're looking at the combinations of these things and they're going to give you totally different information about what a person might need physiologically and psychologically. So another example with for tone, looking at Saturn, um, Saturn has a lot to do with tension, <laughs> how tense or how kind of relaxed are we with what we think we're supposed to be doing, right? Because Saturn has a lot to do with social expectations, norms, rules, what kind of provided structure in our lives. So if we've got a really strong Saturn. Um, sometimes this can bring too much rigidity, which can result in calcification or like stiff stiffness in the body, right? Maybe resulting in rigid emotions, a lack of emotional connection or coldness with people or just not able to be flexible. Or maybe you have a weak Saturn, you know, Saturn that's actually underactive and that can bring you to a space of too much laxity, just too relaxed and not holding anything together. So that can actually create issues in the body like prolapse and hernias and just like organs just not just falling out of where they're supposed to be the connective tissue weakens right so think about okay if i've got connective tissue weakening between my my kidneys and my urethra and my bladder and maybe i'm kind of leaking out urine when i need to be holding it in right what might be going on emotionally maybe are you leaking energy somewhere are you leaking is your are there holes in your aura is there somewhere where you're maybe not holding yourself fully together right? So you, this is kind of how we can go back and forth and tell the story there. Um, and, and again, this can be remedied um, kind of at the same time, right? You can go at some sort of issue like this from, you know, okay, setting healthy boundaries, which is usually an issue when people have a loose or very lax Saturn, right? It's like you need to know how to set healthy boundaries for yourself, for your energy in relationships, in your work. Um, and then you can also do something like take an herb that's an astringent um, that, that's tonifying to the tissues, like horsetail or nettle, kind of to go back to the kidney example, right? If you've got over relaxation or damp stagnation in the kidneys, you want to give yourself an astringent to tighten everything up and tonify it to kind of, again, make, give a healthy boundary inside the tissue. So hopefully this is starting to become clearer as to how, how these things go back and forth. And so this is kind of the, the general list of things that you find when you're you know, looking for planet sign health associations in medical astrology. And again, not an exhaustive list, just kind of like top of the mind things. But, you know, the sun represents our vital force. And then, you know, how is that vital force being pumped through the body? Leo, the heart, right? Um, moon, fluid balance. And like I mentioned before, cancer ruling, you know, the stomach, the breasts, food related issues. How do we feed? How do we feed ourselves? How do we receive food? But also say we have babies. How do we feed our babies, right? Um, a lot of times when there's something going on in, with cancer related archetypes, there could be food intolerance. And I kind of think that this is a big one right now with the North Node in cancer. Notice a lot of people are, there, there's just a higher frequency of people who are doing things like elimination diets or kind of realizing that food just isn't really working for me. It's not feeding me. And maybe I'm not eating enough of this food because I'm noticing that my bones are really brittle or I have constant inflammation or arthritis because I'm not getting the nutrients I need. So this actually brings up the cancer Capricorn axis of integration, right? Like on the cancer side, if you're not feeding yourself properly, that can result in malnutrition of the structure. Capricorn structure can fall apart because it's not getting the nutrients it needs and so on, right? If we have something going on with Mercury, you know, looking at the nervous system, thoughts, right? Um, you can use things like nervines, things like passion flower, valerian root, all of these different kinds of herbs that kind of help us relax the nervous system, kind of help us wind down and um, come a little bit more into our center, maybe out of just being in our minds, a little bit more into our hearts, perhaps. Um, if something is specifically afflicted with Gemini, maybe that's something with the lungs, the breathing, the respiratory system, our speech, our hearing, along with Taurus. Um, Virgo, 
crucial Virgo, you know, ruling an archetype that is just linked to health in general, right? Like the Virgo Pisces axis of health and being a healer. But, you know, it's crucial for the assimilation and absorption of nutrients, right? The small intestine, um, the pancreas, the liver, right? These are like vital organs that keep us filled, basically. We, we die if we don't receive what we need, right? And so if we've got something going on in there, typically it does actually bring us back to the mind and mental health. You know, if we're, this is something that you see often with anxiety. If people have a lot of anxiety, they, you know, it kind of goes the other way too. Like you'll experience a lot of indigestion. Well, maybe why is there indigestion or why are we not receiving and, or maybe why are we not assimilating or absorbing nutrients? Maybe we're eating something we're not supposed to. Uh, maybe we're not getting enough of something that's going to help everything be digested properly. And then of course, when our, um, you know, our gut health is off whack. Maybe we don't have enough probiotics. Maybe we are in antibiotic trauma. Like we take it, we had an earache and we took antibiotics and we wiped out all of the healthy bacteria that help us, you know, to digest food properly. Um, basically left open to disease and so many issues, right? So we want to we want to look at those things and we want to see how that might link to the brain, to the mind health, mental health too. Okay, Mars. Um, Mars is actually the most commonly <laughs> associated planet with illness, especially Mars transits, um, because you know just he's he's like one of our he's like one of our major bad guys. I say that with air quotes, um, along with Saturn. So you definitely want to look at what Mars is doing on your healing journey for sure. He's pretty much always involved in that, um, but he can also say you you're going through something, maybe something like depression, where you have. <laughs> a uh, lower vitality, a lower drive, sex drive is gone, all of those things and like no real desire or will to live. Maybe you can take some herbs that support Mars, right? That bring more of that energy out, right? Because sometimes it's not that Mars is overactive. Sometimes it's that Mars is underactive, which is just as detrimental to overall health. Venus is generally um, pretty easeful, but Again, you can have sometimes too much of a good thing. You can have too much ease. Um, so that can bring, you know, things like tumors, especially associated with Jupiter. Um, fluid retention where there doesn't need to be fluid retention, things like that. And then, you know, Taurus ruling the throat, vocal cords, and lower jaw. Um, and Libra, the kidneys, the fallopian tubes, the urinary tract, and of course, how we keep that acid alkaline balance so crucial. Did you know that in the mouth, um, one of the number one ways to prevent cavities is to keep your mouth at you know a good pH, like seven, seven point five, and, and not too alkaline, not too acidic, because if it's especially we tend to err towards acidic, um, but if it's acidic, you're basically inviting things to want to stay there and thrive and grow and imagine you know if that's going on inside the body imagine sorry inside the mouth imagine what's going on inside the rest of the body so you know libra keeping us in balance fluid balance another fun fact did you know that balance is you know water is required for balance having enough water are you hydrated enough so something i remember uh, learning when I, or talking about when i was teaching a yoga class and you know it's like <laughs> sometimes you can do dancer pose really well and then other times you're like whoa what's going on I can barely like touch my toes did you have enough water that morning you know sometimes it's not that you're losing it or something sometimes it could be that simple you weren't you're not hydrated enough and you're therefore not able to keep balance in the body very very important Okay, again, like I mentioned, Jupiter, um, sometimes you can have too much of a good thing. So with Jupiter, you want to look out for obesity, sluggishness, just excess in general, any enlarged organs. Jupiter also rules the liver along with Virgo. And then, so when we're looking at all of these things, we want to um, kind of zoom out and take into account all of the potentials for how this might Maybe not be actually happening on the physical level. 
how it might be happening energetically, right? And so kind of always going back and forth between these things. Because sometimes people can, you know, come to me and be a little bit terrified. Like say they just learned, they're learning a little bit about medical astrology. They're like, oh my gosh, I've got Jupiter and Virgo. And it's retrograde, my first house. Oh my gosh, am I, am I just destined to liver disease? No, you're definitely not destined toward any sort of disease unless, you know, that does happen to be in, in, in your karma. So I'm not judging that. But just for a lot of people, especially when there's the Virgo association with hypochondria, um, we have a choice in terms of living out the higher frequency of signs, right? So if we know that Jupiter is linked to excess, excess alcohol, excess sweets, excess food that we really don't need just because it tastes good, right? Um, and we know that we have a predisposition towards liver stuff. Maybe take extra good care of your liver. Maybe um, following a wedding and a fun time with friends, you make sure you do some good cleansing with some burdock root and dandelion root. Not saying that we should use herbs just to condone a lifestyle, but there are ways to counterbalance and there's also ways to be strategic right we want to be we want to know our chart we want to know what we're prone to and we want to know that say oh i'm prone to anger and i'm a pizza constitution maybe if i'm out in the hot sun it's not a good idea to also eat pizza with um chili peppers and red wine <laughs> maybe that's a bad combination right <laughs> maybe that's going to give me a rash tomorrow or a sunburn or something's going to get inflamed right so we want to be aware of these things and, and aware that our choices do matter when it comes to health on all levels okay so this is just you know a list that is very you can typically find these kinds of lists in most most books i recommend if you're just getting into this um Judith, Judith Hill, I believe is her name. Yeah, Judith Hill has a good beginner's book on medical astrology. That's where a lot of this, these lists came from. And um, really, there's, there's a lot of good information out there that you can find. And I think the number one sort of approach to this is, again, coming at it from a holistic point of view. It's not that just because say you have um, a, a Capricorn stellium that you're destined to have depression and something wrong with your bones and teeth, right? It's, it's not like if you have this in your chart, this is what is going to happen. It's if, if you have these, these associations in your chart, this is what you want to be aware of. This is what you want to look at. Oh, how can I build this up? How can I strengthen this? If it's not strong already, how can I maximize my archetypes for greatest health? How can I switch this story out of this is I'm out of victimhood, right? Like I'm a victim of my chart, perhaps. How do we switch the story, change a new story to empowerment, knowing that the point of power is always in the present and that we're not victims of our chart. The point is to transcend it, right? Something that I want to also point out with Neptune Pisces, especially the fact that right now Neptune is in Pisces, um, a lot of stuff going on with the lymphatic system and sleeping and psychic draining, noticing how these things are linked, right? Kind of like the opposite of, of Saturn. Saturn pulls everything together. Typically when he's really strong, Neptune is just disintegrates things in the body. So that can definitely lead to um, laxity just like tissue being overly relaxed, things just running out, leaking, really happens, I think, primarily with psychic energy, psychic draining. People who maybe um, are not aware of certain grounding skills and tools and how to clear their energy, how to separate their energy from other people's energy. This is really, really important, right? Because I think a lot of us collectively with Neptune and Pisces, we're all becoming more intuitive. We're becoming more psychic. We're finding, oh my gosh, my dreams have a lot of really powerful information for me. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to write them down. Or, you know, I'm going to feel into the energy of, of this room and kind of see what the people need to hear from me, right? Like we, we are all naturally psychic, but as collectively we're kind of coming back into those skills, some of us are not fully aware of the importance of sovereignty in our space, right? So that's really, really big. Also think about things like prescription drugs and other recreational drugs um, and what that kind of can do in your psychic energy field. So very, very important to just kind of consider that. That's a conversation for a whole other time. But if you're curious about that, definitely um, connect with me. It's a lot of work that I've been doing. Um, okay, so that kind of leads me into looking at 
some of these other big transits. Chiron and Aries, again, we definitely want to look at what our Aries story is. Um, what's, what's our connection to our energy and our passion and perhaps our anger? Um, how are we, how are we using the energy of, of Chiron and Aries to really catapult us into an empowered, a self-empowered healing journey? That's really what this is all about, right? Um, and a big time focus with North Node in Cancer, focusing on self-care, focusing on eating properly, um, taking care of ourselves properly so that we're able to do the work that we really want to do um, so that we can kind of release any structure or rigidity that isn't working for us with that South Node in Capricorn conjunct Saturn and Pluto. Big time with Uranus and Taurus. We, we want to look at kind of what are our values and how are they shaping our routines? Are your routines and your schedule and your daily lifestyle and how you're using resources, are they really aligned with your values? And if they're not, eventually you're going to find out, right? You know, the Uranus mantra to choose change before change chooses you. Most of the times we're aware of what needs to change. And then if we just kind of ignore that voice that tells us, hey, you should probably switch your routine up. This isn't working. There's going to be something that happens that will kind of force you to sh shift your routine. So just having the awareness of that and, and looking at what that can do, um, you know, in terms of, you know, throat, throat stuff, thyroid issues, hormones, all of those kinds of things, your vocal cords, ears, um, things that are parts of the body that are ruled by Taurus and kind of sensing into how the height of Taurus is, is being solidly grounded on two feet. And so with Uranus being linked to the nervous system and, and sometimes anxiety, the types of anxieties that we could have right now could be very linked to people not being in nature enough, people not being grounded and on their two feet, people not being part of their food story, kind of cultivating the food, knowing what they're eating, knowing what they're putting in their bodies and that sort of thing definitely can increase anxiety. I think we're coming to, this is again, another collective transit where we know it's very important for us to have time outside. It's very important for us to to see green, to see greenery, to see trees, to be able to walk barefoot on the earth and, and to eat good, clean, healthy food. So if something like that is, is not happening, Uranus is probably gonna show you where and how it needs to happen. Um, Jupiter and Sagittarius, I think this is an excellent time, especially that we just um, popped into Uranus, or sorry, Jupiter retrograde um, to really look at our philosophies of health, look at how thoughts become things. Um, look at new theories that can maybe link you to a greater whole, more interconnectedness. How does this all link to our cosmic healing journey again with that Neptune and Pisces, especially they've been going back and forth in these squares. Oh, what, what is often how I'm understanding truth, right? This goes to how we look at our health journey as well. Something I should also say um, in regards to the Neptune and Pisces, as we're all kind of increasing our intuition and learning about how to not let ourselves be psychically drained um we could do things simple things like reflexology or looking into traditional chinese medicine like acupuncture and different herbs again things like that that can just help us to feel holistic to feel like everything's connected like that there's no phantom limbs like oh i'm totally just living in my head and i'm not connected to the rest of my body right um this this sort of holistic approach to knowing ourselves, to being with ourselves is so important um, when we're talking about overall health. Because Neptune can actually often kind of represent um, weird issues that are difficult to diagnose. You're like, I'm not sure why, but I just feel weird in my body. Things are not working properly. Well, remember Neptune, Pisces also represents the lymphatic system. And this is something that we don't really see. We hardly even talk about it, actually. Um, but it's so important. It's like if, if our lymph is not draining properly, if, if the, you know, the lymph from our hands is not getting back to our heart or the lymph from our feet is not getting back up, you know, it, stuff's getting stagnant, stuff is getting stuck. Think about what that's going to do to your energy body. Think about what that's going to do to your emotions and your ability to see and think clearly if, if things aren't fully... Um, moving where they're supposed to, right? Like we can look at the height of Neptune as clarity and the lows of Neptune as confusion, right? Our bodies can be confused. If our bodies aren't feeling very clear, think about what that can do in the mind and the emotions. So 
This is also important to know that the majority of the lymphatic system, the lymph nodes, are in the gut. So again, this is where we come into that Pisces-Virgo um, correlation, right? Virgo being how are we assimilating nutrients, Pisces being kind of the immune system response around what we're eating, right? So say we have an intolerance and something's off, the, the lymph, lymphatic system is going to blow up, expand, maybe we're going to actually get physically bloated in our bellies and then we're not going to feel like we're even able to eat because we still feel full because our lymph system is super inflamed because something's in there that's not supposed to be in there. I mean, you can know that your body's working and it's doing a good job. The lymph system, the immune system, it's just firing up because it's trying to get something foreign out of there that's not supposed to be in there. Um, but what that can do is take away that energy from other places, right? Like our body has an intelligence when it perceives a threat somewhere, the majority of you know, the white blood cells and, and kind of the, the army is going to go on to either attack mode or defend mode in the place where it's needed most, which can take energy away from other spaces that can lead to head fogginess. Again, can definitely lead to anxiety, not having clarity about your life because your body's busy figuring out what on earth did I eat? <laughs> <laughs> right and i'm kind of oversimplifying it and being facetious there but just something good to think about okay how much more did i make Ooh, got a lot for you guys okay um looking at transits you definitely want to look at the relationship between your natal chart so natal chart definitely first and foremost hands down for everybody you want to know what's going on in there first and then if you're ready for the next avenue of, of decoding and deconstructing your story look at okay current story this is the current scene where's the sun what are the dips and surges in my energy like right now in my vitality you know in in depending on that relationship um what and this is a good way to actually just get to know yourself to get to know your patterns I and mean, you're going to experience the sun moving through all 12 signs each year so you know whether you've begun this journey a long time ago and you're aware of how it feels for you in airy season or maybe you're just getting started take a look at you know what is what is coming up for me right now like what do i feel like i want to do what am i being pulled toward right now what am i being driven by what is inspiring to me what am i learning how's my consciousness expanding all of these things and then take note of where the planets are and and take note of um you know just your response and that's how you learn to track and master your cycles um definitely looking at where mercury is transiting for the quality of your thoughts if you're suffering from anxiety or depression things like that how is your nervous system functioning um are you breathing well there's definitely certain times of the year where i even myself notice i'm breathing really shallow right now compared to other times when i feel like i'm getting enough oxygen versus not so you know even our breathing will go through these cycles remember that mercury rules the weather it's also the weather of the body, the weather of our experience, right? Is it cool? Is it balmy? Is it blissful? Is it super intense and windy and confusing and I can't see anything, right? It's our perception. It's very linked to what we're doing. What are we choosing to do with our bodies that's going to kind of change the weather? Um, where Mars is transiting, definitely look for where there might be more triggers that can bring out some anger, that can bring up some passion, that can bring up like, yeah, this is a special cause that I want to fight for. Maybe it's just like, oh, watch out because there could be an accident. Maybe you're moving too fast. Maybe you're overly um, ramped up and it's causing headaches and fevers and migraines and all of these things. And where Venus is transiting, you can typically look at how things are easeful and um, overall harmony. But again, this can bring up people that maybe pull up some interesting things to deal with or you know definitely looking at what's going on with fluids in the body just overall physical harmony are you in balance is your body in balance with itself with its natural constitution so this is where we get into some of the healing potential so like i was just mentioning is your body in balance with itself with its natural constitution all of us have a natural balance that works for us it's going to be a little bit different than everybody else's and that you know is going to constitute what kind of foods we eat even what kind of clothes that we wear what do we put on our skin um, how long do we sleep what are our energy levels like what is our you know emotional temperament all of these kinds of things 
And it goes back to those um, energetic states that I mentioned before. You know, do you tend towards hot or cold? Do you tend in your tissues and in your temperament towards wet or dry, tense or relaxed? And in what combination? Um, and so you want to know that about yourself. You know, and so those are the Ayurvedic doshas, right? And so if you're not familiar with that, definitely that's a fun it's a whole place to take a look at. But most people are kind of aware of, oh, I'm a vata pitta. You know, usually you're a combination of two, um, at least. It's, it's more rare to see somebody who's like just one thing. Um, and we all have all of those, you know, in some, in some measure in our bodies. Um, you know, vatas tend toward anxiety. Pittas tend toward anger, inflammation, and kapha tends toward depression and cold, right? Because vata tends to be um, cold and usually dry, maybe tense. Um, pittas tend to be, you know, hot because <laughs> it's fire. Um, they can be wet or dry and tense or relaxed. And then kapha tends to be cold, wet, and relaxed so it's kind of just like asking for stagnation when when kapha is not really dealt with right kapha tends to accumulate you know in the stomach and that's where the majority of our toxins can get stored so imagine you're just kind of sitting around and you're just watching tv all day and you're just eating nachos with cheese and sour cream all these very like um kapha foods or not even kapha foods um just tamasic foods you know foods that have very low amounts of um prana right and and you're just kind of sitting around doing nothing you're kind of asking for stagnation <laughs> you're asking for your your organs to kind of um you know accumulate toxins and things like that and and you know i'm talking if, if somebody's doing this like every single day for months you know not if you just do it on you know once a month or something like that so you also want to notice when it comes to the physical level, what I just mentioned, but also, you know, in the emotional. So what are our tendencies towards certain emotions, towards maybe feeling stuck in certain patterns and maybe what physical correspondences are there? So, you know, somebody who's running really hot can be inflamed. They can also be often explosive in anger, which is a typical Mars affliction. This person might need some support with cooling. You know, they might need something like nettle that can kind of cool and bring nutrients and, and soothing to, uh, to the body. Kind of help you release pent up emotions because it's a diuretic, right? Or maybe you want to give somebody moon herbs venus herbs and plants like apples right apples are like this delicious cooling venus plant venus food um typically you want them to be demulcent so moistening you want them to be relaxant a lot of the times because there can be that like tension that builds up with the heat um maybe something like relaxant or nervine that kind of soothes the nervous system like passion flower or you know marshmallow root that really nice demulcent moistens everything and it tastes really yummy and sweet and so these are things that can bring soothing and cooling and moisture. Um, and so if you think about Mars, when Mars is really afflicted and in your body is also manifesting, that can bring excess heat, which can then lead to dryness, right? Because it can burn things up. Think about things like kidney stones or <laughs> gallstones, <laughs> really, really painful things. It's like everything's cooking up too fast and the water's all gone and now there's just stones left right it's like we don't want that we want to make sure that there's enough moisture in there and then if you think about what's going on emotionally that can definitely mean you know bouts of anger and explosive anger and then a depletion sense of a headache dehydration or more serious issues and so again how we might rewrite this story is going to be very linked to oh, instead of like oh, you know what i'm just an angry person and i'm just destined to be angry all the time and i'm just destined to be triggered by everything maybe make a choice to eat different foods that can bring a little bit more cooling or soothing um take take some time to feel into what usually helps you come back to your center instead of making an assumption that oh this is just in my chart i'm just a mars and aries i'm just always going to be like this you know those kinds of statements are often indications of a false story anytime we say i always or i never or this is happening to me because like blaming something there's there's some aspect of the story that definitely has room to shift so in the end you just want to turn What's going on in your chart? What's going on with your story into a story that you'd like to read, right? We all have the power. It's our choice whether our 
lives and our story and our healing journey is is tragic or heroic or comedic maybe <laughs> let's go hero comedy right rather than tragic comedy um and, and definitely it's important to layer our charts between our physiology and our psychology just to find a more interconnected story to see how it all comes together and and to find varying avenues and angles for healing support so what's your healing story Hopefully this is helpful for you guys. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. You can find me at my website, jordanrochelle.com, or please leave um, a comment if you're watching this on YouTube or on Facebook. And I will connect with you that way. Wishing you all well in your healing journey. <laughs>